The talk today is called Sunrising React Native, which is contrary to what you've been told for the last 30 minutes. So I'm going to see if I can remove the negative effects of Victor from you guys. Why is he not here? Come on. All right. He's too afraid for the truth. Don't worry. OK. So we're going to, this is, a, this is an intro to React Native, basically. And we're going to talk about a very famous article that Airbnb released a little while back. So uh, as Michael mentioned, uh, my name is Mo. Uh, I'm the head of mobile uh, here in the UK for Theodo. Theodo is a global consultancy with just over 700 people right now. So we've been building digital products, web, mobile, whatever have you, for Fortune 500 companies, but also startups, everything in between. You may know us by a different name, BAM. So BAM is our mobile specialist startup based in France. They've built a bunch of open source in React Native. They've been doing it since 2015 when it came out. So libraries like React Native Image Resizer, or you might recognize Flashlight, um, which is built by one of my colleagues, Alexander, uh, and it's basically used to measure uh, mobile performance. All of this is not to get you sold on Theodore, by the way. This is just to say, like, we've been in the mobile space for a little while, invested in it. And so being in the consultancy space, oftentimes people start to ask you questions about which tech they should use, what platforms they should invest in. Uh, and a lot of the time, the right answer is React Native. Uh, for mobile, and you'll typically get a little bit more pushback than usual. You'll get asked questions like, should we really use React Native for the next mobile app that we build? Is it actually stable? Are there any serious apps that are built with React Native? And then at the very end, they'll just be like, well, isn't Native better anyway, right? So there's this cloud of doubt cast over React Native. And the essence is, can we trust React Native? Is it a trustworthy technology? And could we put the success of our company at stake with adopting a uh, technology like React Native? So unfortunately, back in 2018, Airbnb was like known as the go-to adopter of React Native other than Facebook. Uh, and then they wrote this article, Sunsetting React Native. And they basically were saying, look, we had a bunch of technical and organizational issues, and we're not going to be focusing on React Native anymore. We're just going to be going fully native. And so this caused a lot of damage to the reputation of React Native. And we want to look at what has changed since 2018, because these guys were using it in 2017 till today. Uh, and we can go from there. So let's start talking about React Native. We're going to try to answer the question, what is React Native? How does it work? Who uses it in the real world? Like what apps actually use it that you might know? And what is the future of React Native? So how does it work? Let's, this is broken down into several parts, but if you look at React, fundamentally, it's a UI library, and it's agnostic to the rendering platform. So on web, you will have React, and then you pair that with React DOM, which is saying, how should it be rendered on the DOM? And it works for web apps. And so at some point, when React came out in 2013, a little while after, people said, well, you know, this would be a nice way to build UIs in, in native as well. And as uh, Victor mentioned, you know, back then, the state of native mobile development was just in shambles. If you've ever written Objective-C, old Objective-C code, you'll know the pain that I'm referring to. So it was a mess, and building UIs in React was something that was just so pleasant comparatively. So replace that. The React Native team replaced the renderer layer, and you use the app registry in React Native, and basically you had React Native. Now, this is a gross oversimplification. In reality, this is the new architecture that's in React Native, and even this is a simplified version. So there's a lot of parts that go into this. But the gist of it is that you've got some JavaScript React code. In the middle, there's a conversion layer that allows JavaScript code to talk to native level code. And then each platform will execute some JavaScript code and so on and so forth. The middle layer is now called the JSI. It's this new architecture that they've been working on for like three years. It's going to be like the standard at some point, but it's still experimental. And things like Fabric and Turbo modules, Fabric basically is the renderer engine. So it says, if you give me a React element, what will that render on native? Uh, and it's, that handles the engine for the conversion layer. Uh, Turbo modules uh, handles when you want to have native code running from your React native uh, code, if you want to call up some native code. So uh, to, to give you an example here, and this is one of the core misconceptions that people have about React native, you have a view. Uh, that's coming inside of your React Native code. That is an element in React Native. It goes through that middle layer, and on the other side, after some processing, comes out Android view and UI view. These are the native views on each side, and then they get used up by each one. So you don't have some like web views rendering it, because 
generally some people think it's like Ionic or something where you just have web views that are kind of acting like mobile views. No, these are actual genuine mobile views, mobile text elements, so on and so forth. So at React Native London, we had Taz uh, give a talk a few months ago, and he had this slide, so I've just stolen that line exactly, but it's, React Native is native, uh, effectively. And if you look at the Airbnb article, somewhere buried somewhere down, it actually mentions something almost identical to this, which is React Native is great because it's native. So uh, yeah, funny how things work out. Taking a step back again from like the architecture, what this means is React Native has two layers to it. In a React Native app, you've got a JavaScript layer, and you've also got a native layer. The split between JavaScript and native code is something that has been changing and adopting over the years in the React Native space. I think the community is trying to figure out what is the nice uh, balance between the two. And I think we're starting to reach that equilibrium. A lot of code now runs on the native layer. And there's been tools that we're going to look at in a little bit that, that makes it easier for you to run native code from JavaScript. Uh, and so things like animation, they should probably be run on the native thread so that they're smooth and not janky and that type of stuff. So this is something that we're figuring out. But important to note, you've got JavaScript and you've got native. Now, with JavaScript, there comes the nice advantage of uh, the fact that JavaScript can kind of just be shipped over the air. So if you decide, I want to actually change some of my JavaScript code, uh, what you could do is you could just generate a new JavaScript bundle and then send that to some server. And afterwards, your React Native app can actually start listening for new changes to JavaScript. And then it can just update the JavaScript layer without even going through an app store. And this is something that's quite unique to React Native. I don't think any other, I know Flutter doesn't do this, Kotlin doesn't have anything like this, and neither does like Swift apps. So this, is, this concept of over the air updates is quite cool. What that means in reality is that you can basically update your app at a much faster rate. You shouldn't abuse this, and that's usually the question that comes up. You can, faster, you can have faster iterations. You can release out code to your users quicker if you've got a bug fix, because you don't have to wait like hours at the very bare minimum to get it approved by Apple. So it's quite powerful, but it also lets me do what I'm about to do next, which is have a bit of a wacky interactive demo. So we're using a meta framework, quote, quote, called Expo. And it makes building React Native apps super simple. You guys have downloaded Expo Go. Who's downloaded Expo Go? Anyone have Expo Go? OK, that's more than I expected. So go ahead and scan that QR code. We've already got six connected devices here. Should I zoom that in? All right, everyone, scan the QR code. OK, so this is a very basic app. This is, there's not much to this. This is just a few lines of code. And effectively, what we've got here is we've got a map view, which you'll see on the right in the simulator. And that map view is a native map view. It's not like some web view of a map view. And what that means is if I actually scan this on my phone, and I'll just start to show you some of the gestures that you can do on, your, on this. If I have something open on my phone, first of all, it's detected that my phone is in dark mode. So all of the native functionalities and the system settings that you have automatically come with it. And this is a swift view that we've got. But it also means that you know, I can do anything that I'm used to on the native layer effectively. Because this is a native map view and nothing more with a wrapper that is in React. And the markers that you see there, those markers are React native views that have then been translated down to Android users as Android views and to iOS users as UI views. And in theory, with a little bit of modification, I can also run this on web. And the animations are running on the native layer animation driver. So we're basically running very, very minimal JavaScript code here. And most of this is done out of the box without me needing to write a single line of native code. Now, one of the nice things about this ecosystem right now is it's so well developed that you have access to so much native functionality without needing to ever develop native code. So what do I mean by that? I want to actually add some haptic feedback to every time that you click on one of those markers on the map. So what you can do here is I've imported haptics from this library called Expo Haptics. Expo's got a whole bunch of these native libraries. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually, are you actually feeling the, the haptic feedback so far? OK, cool. I've ruined my demo. It's fine. I'm going to remove the, fee the haptic feedback because Victor's told me it's crap. So haptic feedback's gone. And now, because it's all over the air, you should have gotten the update instantly. You're not going to get that anywhere else. So 
Magic. Woo. Okay, cool. Cool. So you got a little view into like how easy it is to change things on React Native, how quick and responsive it is as a developer. The DevX has gotten really good over the past few years. We've talked about how it works. Obviously, we can go into more detail. There's a lot of content. Just look it up as you're interested. All right. Let's talk about usages of React Native. So uh, React Native, as you might know, is uh, owned by Meta, or it's open source by Meta. Uh, it's a very thriving project. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of uh, stars, bunches of forks. Many companies have internal forks of it as well if they want to modify it. But it's a thriving community. There's a massive ecosystem around it. Uh, it's not some library that's got a few hundred stars in it. You know, it's something that's very serious, and you can trust it within your applications. And beyond GitHub stars, because they're not the arbiter of truth, let's look at some apps that are built with it. So Meta has built parts of the Facebook app, but also the entire Ads Manager app in its entirety, and some of the Oculus app with React Native. Microsoft, surprisingly, has a pretty big stake in React Native. So they've built the Office apps, the Outlook apps, and the Xbox Game Pass apps. And Shopify famously in 2020 announced that they are going all in on React Native. And they've got the Shopify app and some of the other apps for sellers all built in React Native. So you've got three heavyweights in the tech industry with a lot of money pumping cash into React Native. So it's, it's a good place to be. And what that means is beyond the apps that they build for themselves, they actually output a lot of code for you to be able to use in your projects. So Meta obviously manages React Native. But also, they have the Hermes engine, which is like a fast JavaScript engine that's optimized to run React Native on devices like iOS, Android, and I think also on Mac OS and uh, Windows. Uh, Metro is the bundler that they've built specifically for React Native. So they're really managing that side of it. Microsoft, on the other hand, has kind of taken ownership of Windows and Mac OS ports of React Native and some tools like RNX Kit. And then you've got Shopify solving some of the problems that people typically talk about in React Native, like slow lists with flash list are in Skia to have nice canvases to render stuff on, and then a UI library like Restyle. So they're invested in the open source of this ecosystem as well, which is great. But it's not just the big names. Like, this is usually there's these screenshots come from Evan Bacon, who's one of the Expo core team members. And he goes on the App Store and looks at what apps actually use React Native. And average is about 25% of the apps in the top 100 apps in the US, at least, seem to use React Native. So libraries, apps like that shop, which is by Shopify, Klarna, you might know. There's a few here that are basically using React Native under the hood, like Capital One and so on and so forth. So, and a lot of these apps are really highly rated. This, this notion that it's hard to create good quality of React Native apps is one that I just fundamentally disagree with. And I think there's ample proof that teams have been able to, to manage that. So I want to talk about the feature a little bit. Did anyone go to AppJS other than Michael? Michael? Cool. There was a... There was a talk there called React Native 2030, where Fernando Rojo talks about like, the future of React Native from predictions more than anything, really. But he talks about the, the previous state of React Native and where we're at right now. And, you know, the common issues that people have with React Native is things like lists are slow, images aren't optimized and cached properly, you know, shared transitions are a pain, native code is difficult to integrate with a React Native app if you don't know what you're doing. And so over the years, especially in the last, I'd say, couple of years, the community's kind of come together and, uh, and proposed some solutions. This is ripped directly from this guy's talk, by the way. So that's why I mentioned his name. Don't give me, don't give me slack for this. And so, you know, Shopify made Flash List, Expo Image, and then things like Reanimated allow you to now do shared element transitions as quickly as possible. And then native code is becoming easier and easier to integrate. So we'll get into that in a second. So this is really interesting to know the state of things, but I, I kind of want to talk about the things that I'm excited about. So this is the uh, subjective part of this talk. So one is simpler integrations with the native layer. So the new architecture is kind of being worked on actively. Turbo modules makes it easier to integrate native level code with a bare React Native architecture. And they're making steps to make this more accessible to apps that are brownfield, like adding the new render interoperability layer. Uh, stuff like that makes it easier for old React Native apps to start to adopt some libraries that use this new architecture. But outside of the world of Meta, um, a lot of people are now using Expo. And Expo was traditionally limited by how much native code you could, you could use that wasn't within their sort of client. And they've been taking some really great steps to make this easier than ever before. So uh, config plugins allows you to basically write uh, plugins that will modify the native level code in any Expo project. That is really cool, because you can still stay within that ecosystem and do any changes you want to the native layer. 
But beyond that, the Expo Modules API is really cool. So this is, this is 2021, so not as new anymore, but you know, new enough. Uh, so we're going to go over this. And this is a way where you can define a module of code in Swift and Kotlin uh, pretty easily and run that uh, if you need in your React Native app. So this is uh, the example that they have in their docs. Um, you can see the Swift and the Kotlin code on the left and the right. So you basically uh, define a module. And within that, you specify the name of the module, but you also talk about, oh, sorry about that. And then you talk about functions. You might have some methods and some events that live within there. And these all will, can then call other Swift files and call other Swift functions, or they can just kind of like all live within this one file. That's not best practice, but you know, just for the sake of this example, it's there. And it's the same on the Kotlin. So you can see the syntax here is very similar beyond what, like to the extreme that they could have made the syntax similar, what their languages would have allowed, they've done it. And it's quite nice because there's that like familiarity. As long as you're familiar with the way that they've defined their API, it's quite easy for you to get started, even if you don't know Swift for Kotlin. So that's very basic. We're just going to have a function that call, that's called get theme, and it just returns system on both. You can make it more complex later and learn how to do that. And then you have a module definition in TypeScript that says, like, here are the functions that are going to be exported by this module. At this stage, you have to cast the types, but they're actively kind of working on stuff to make some of the types deduced. And then you use it inside of your React Native code, and it's pretty much that. I, with changing sort of three files, each of them less than 10 lines, you can basically create your own native module. Uh, which is really powerful and really cool. Uh, and I think it makes it more accessible to people who haven't written native code before, but it also just makes it so much easier. And you don't have to worry about it, and it's all handled within that ecosystem. So we're bridging, and this is pun totally intended, the gap between JavaScript and native. And hopefully, we're all going to be very happy developers. So talking about bridging the gap between JavaScript and native, has anyone heard of universal apps? Two, three, four. You've heard it because I specifically ranted about it to you. You don't count. Four, OK. It's my coworker. I'm not this mean. So this idea that you can write once and run anywhere. So the vision with React Native isn't that you write once and it just kind of runs everywhere. It's that you learn once the APIs of how like, React Native works, and then you can write it for any platform that you want. There will be platform-specific um, differences. People in the community, though, they, they kind of wanted to go a step further and just run for them wherever they want. And so this vision has been fueling a lot of open source. And so there's a lot of libraries like React Native for web. It basically means that you can run your React Native views and text, and it'll just convert it into web elements for you in the DOM. But there's also a lot of other libraries that are being built, like UI libraries, styling libraries, navigation libraries, that basically means you just write one set of code, and it just kind of works on web and mobile. And this is really cool, because instead of having three teams initially, which is iOS, Android, and web, you would reduce that down to first two teams with React Native, which is mobile and web. And then maybe in some utopian future, you can just have one team that understands front end and the full complexity of it. And so we've actually been trialing this a lot with some of our newest projects. Uh, this is the, the sort of the, the architecture, the folder structure of uh, one of our newest projects that we're working on. Um, what we've actually done here is flip things around. This is a universal app. We've got an apps directory, but there's a bunch of packages. And each of these packages are either going to be managed by one person or by one team, specifically. So, and they're, they're kind of split by the features of the application. So things like home page is a feature. Listen, read, watch, these are all kind of features. And so what that means is that if you look inside of each of these features, they'll contain the core business logic, anything that's common in the React Native space, like some of the components. But also, if there's any specific iOS code that's necessary, uh, Android code or web code, they can kind of live within this package. And so what that means is you're kind of taking your platform teams, teams that might have an iOS developer, an Android developer, and a web developer, and you're making them product specialists in that specific part of their feature, which is really cool because it can oftentimes accelerate and you don't have to worry about too much context switching between different features and parts of a big app. So you might have seen this before. The next natural step is why can't we just have micro front ends for mobile? And this is kind of the, the long-term game that I think we can play with. So if anyone's familiar with Webpack, there's module federation here. And with module federation, it basically means that there's a shell sort of bundle that you have. And it can access different sub bundles. And they can all have different deployment streams and different processes to there's this sort of like a discovery of different bundles. And what that means is different teams can manage parts and chunks of an application. And so people have tried to use this with React Native. There's this Webpack port called Repack. It's a toolkit that lets you basically use module federation with React Native. The issue with this is that 
Webpack isn't the de facto bundler for React Native, it's Metro. And you have a lot of issues introduced when you start to use Webpack. So just to show you the other direction that people are going in, people would use Webpack on React Native for React Native for Web. Uh, Expo now comes pre-packaged with Metro for Web. So they're stepping away from Webpack as much as they can to standardize it all within Metro to work across web and mobile. So you've almost got this divergence of where the different sort of community players are going. And I think ultimately it will be great if, and I think this is something that is possible, uh, Metro will start to support some mechanism very similar to module federation. Because then you can build something which is an app that's got a bunch of different federated apps within them, micro front ends, if you will, that are native layer sort of sub apps within them. And that is something that I think can be a game changer for the mobile development space because you're suddenly allowing this new scale of enterprise level application development, especially for super apps like in China, you'll have WeChat that basically does anything you could want in, in, in functionality. And you, know, you need multiple teams for that and this is gonna be groundbreaking for that. And uh, something that I'm looking at a lot and working on, so I won't go into too much detail, but I think this is a really cool thing to, to see coming into fruition. So we've talked about what React Native is, how it works, what the usages are, and what the future is. Now let's get back to that Airbnb to art article, right? That's why you're here. So the article is not all doom and gloom. There is definitely nuance to it. Uh, unfortunately, people read like the subtitle and then they kind of just make a decision and say, oh, this means React Native is bad. No, they, they talk a lot about things that, that work well. You know, if you look at the tech section of that article, they talk about how cross-platforms help them share about 90% of the code across, web, uh, across mobile, uh, Android, and iOS. They really loved using React. Obviously, it was a declarative UI library that they could use, and they didn't have access to that on the native layer. So many different things. One of, the, one of them was the collaboration with web, which I think is interesting, because again, they were sharing things like their Redux stores across web and mobile, so it saved them a lot of uh, functionality, but it also gave them feature parity across the two. And you know, if you look at the, the survey that they did among their, their developers, 80% actually described it as positive or incredibly positive. Uh, there's only about 20% that weren't happy about it. So it was more of an organizational thing. So what actually went wrong? And if you dig into the details, they weren't happy about the sort of the maturity of the ecosystem for native functionality, as one example. And now the Expo SDK, as you saw, has a bunch of different libraries like Haptics that makes it super easy for you to integrate them. You don't need to be on an Expo app to use those libraries either. They're accessible on any React Native library that just make it significantly easier in an Expo managed workflow. Like, like the lack of type safety in React Native was a big thing for them. They were really struggling with refactors. They couldn't keep a track of all of this. They tried to use Flow back in the day, it wasn't good. So TypeScript is now actually the default language within React Native apps, whether you start them in Expo or you start them with the bare React Native CLI. So things are starting to move in the right direction. You may have different opinions about TypeScript in itself, and that's, that's a whole thing, but that's just the language. That, that's more restrictions on the language rather than I'd say React Native. Another interesting thing was inconsistent performance of JavaScript engines. So they were relying on JavaScript core at that stage, and the version of JavaScript core on Android was just notoriously horrible. It was okay on iOS, and so with Hermes now being the default in React Native, if you look at the left, this is actually made by Alexander Moreau, who does some of our performance stuff. On the left-hand side, that's just a basic app without Hermes, and it takes several seconds to open. On the right-hand side, it's on a low-end Android phone with Hermes, and it just loads pretty much instantly. I'll let that go one more time. It's about 26 seconds for the start of time. So Hermes done within a second, the other side. And this is on a J7, which is as bad of a performance phone that you can find anywhere, so yeah. And then also, I'm sorry if anyone has a J7, by the way. <laughs> and then a, also about the slow app times and the render speed, which you, we just saw there. The other thing is lists. People seem to really struggle with lists on React Native. And it's, I think it's largely due to the existence of, existence of flat lists. The fact that flat lists exist as a default React Native component, people kind of think, oh, this is what I should use deceivingly, and then you struggle. And so this is a comparison with using flat list versus flash list in terms of the JS thread getting blocked. If you see on the left-hand side, the JS thread is getting blocked. That's not like delays in getting data, that's just the JS thread getting blocked. Whereas on the right-hand side with flash list, you're pretty much just scrolling without stop. So there's a lot of these things that have been worked on over the years that makes it significantly better to develop a React Native app with a higher quality. Uh, the other thing that they mentioned was upgrading React Native versions. There's now the React Native upgrade helper. It's not perfect, but it gives you a little bit more support in doing it. 
And then there's also Expo Upgrade. If you're in a managed workflow, it just basically does it for you and tells you maybe these libraries might need a little bit of manual work. But in all in all, it pretty much does it for you. I've had like maybe one instance where I've had to actually go into the code and fix stuff. As you can see, there's a lot of these points that maybe aren't applicable anymore. You know, React Native in 2017, 2018 is not the same beast that it is today. And so the response since has been mixed. So Shopify in 2020 announced, well, we're going all in on React Native and we're actually going to try to just like fully adopt it as much as physically possible for our functionality, which was really cool. It kind of revived the image of React Native a little bit. And their CEO seems very passionate about this decision. Somebody asked him like, didn't Airbnb just ditch React Native? And he's like, well, uh, you guys should try out React Native, it's pretty good. Yeah, just joking with you. Okay, so all of this is to say I've ranted, rambled on, talked about some opinions and, and whatnot. All of this is to say that there's just like a lot of exciting stuff in store right now. There's people far smarter than me working on React Native. And I hope that this has kind of got you slightly more excited about React Native or maybe just interested in looking into it. Because honestly, I do believe that there is an incredibly bright future awaiting React Native. <laughs> If you want to stay on connected on the app formerly known as Twitter, that's the QR code and that's LinkedIn. So yeah. I guess a thing that I hear a lot and that Victor kind of touched on was like like the breakability of React Native as a framework. You know, it seems like from the get-go there's a lot of choices to be made and it's easy to do it wrong. Mm -hmm. How big of a problem do you actually think that is for a company looking to build an app now and how do you mitigate that? I, I think you've got to give incredible kudos to the Expo team because if you are trying to start a React Native app as a beginner, especially without uh, any of the, those decisions made and it not being as opinionated enough, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot so many times. And so I think with Expo, it's quite simple because of how opinionated it is, how many SDKs you have access to, and the documentation that's just there for you. It kind of holds your hands throughout the process and teaches you how to do a lot of these things like how you go through your builds and how you set up your updates with them. And a lot of that's done kind of out of the box, but it, it really explains some of those concepts to you. So I think you have less choices to make with Expo. As you delve deeper in, obviously it's a little bit more flexible in, that, in those ways and you can make a lot of mistakes and a lot of apps do. But I, I think the scope of it has gotten so much better now with Expo and with Expo being so mature that I don't think there's much of a risk for it, for, especially for small size apps and for startups. I think they're going to be great. For larger scale apps, I think you need to have an architecture conversation and you need to really plan it out. But I think it's something that can be incredibly powerful, especially with sort of things like Expo modules where you can kind of define how much, how much native code you want to have and you can write some native modules. Yeah, I think I've gone on a, another tangent. I want to ask about that over the air JavaScript bundle updates. Are there any limitations of what sources you can update? You, you can update anything that doesn't require any new native code. So if your app suddenly needs some extra Swift or Kotlin code bundled into the package, that won't be updatable over the air. What you can update is, let's say, in the case that we were doing, we were doing over the air updates, right? My, you, the apps that you had installed on your phone, they already had all of the native code to cause a vibration. So. I didn't need to send that native code. You, you didn't need to receive that native code anymore. All I was sending was sending the JavaScript invocations of the, of the native code to say, run the vibration on so-and-so's phone, right? So if you want to make things typically, that means if you're not adding any new native libraries to your application, you'll be fine. If you're making things like a, a bug fix on the, the JavaScript layer, maybe you've mishandled an API call or something like that, you can fix that and send that over the air. Isn't that raising any security issues? Can I send new? You could, yes. So it, it, one of the things that then people say about this is, okay, well, what if I just change the entire functionality of my app, right? Apple's guidelines on this are that you, and, and it's the same probably with Google, I'd say, is you can't change the nature of your app without going through an app store review process. So if you do that, your users will report you and your app will get taken down by the end of the day usually, depending on how quick they are. So yes, you can circumvent that whole process, but you can also probably write that in Swift and Kotlin to some capacity. Like you could write some engine that will then like listen for some code and then execute something that you don't want to be executed. So it's not, it, it just gives you the functionality to send some JavaScript code. But yes, you can definitely abuse it. You shouldn't abuse it because your app will get taken down. 
And all of the uh, bundles that are sent over the air are like code signed and everything. So in, th in that sense, you're, you're safe. But it's more, can the developers do something shady? And yes, they can, yeah. During the demo, like, uh, you used the online editor, and then you changed something, and then the change was immediate on the simulator. What, what's the setup? How did you do that? That, so it, it, on the simulator specifically, that'll work with any React Native application that you have because you're, every time that you change your, your JavaScript code, you're effectively doing a hot reload. And so it ships the bundles with Metro. It ships those bundles directly to whatever device has been listening for the JavaScript bundles. So any React Native application that you build, if you just go and like start a new React Native application or you start a new Expo application, They'll, they'll have this live reload functionality. And so what we used here was an Expo Snack. It's basically like a cloud-hosted version of that, which basically exposes those QR, QR codes to the internet, so it's serving the bundles to everyone publicly. So you, you're able to use it on your phone and everybody else's, regardless of what network they're on. So first of all, I wanted to say, it was a nice explanation you provided. I've been using React Native for years now. I've used Expo. I've enjoyed over-the-air updates, running over tunnel, a lot of cool features provided by Expo. But Vector was throwing a very important thing regarding the native code. So right now, what you've said, what you've mentioned, now we have Jetpack in, in Kotlin, and we have uh, SwiftUI, right? Compose and SwiftUI. And I've, I've uh, looked at both, and they are quite similar. So don't you think we reach a place where one mobile developer can do both instead of going for React Native to have the native, you know, performance touch with? I, th I think to some degree you can, yeah, the, the convergence of them is, is that they're getting closer, right? And they're, they're actually all inspired by React. So Jetpack is officially like said, oh, we've, we've, we've like taken a lot of these concepts from declarative UI frameworks like React. And I think it's the same with Swift as well. Um, so yeah, they're all getting closer, and it means they're getting closer to React Native as well. Um, so it means if you're a React Native developer, you can probably write easier Swift UI code and easier Jetpack Compose code as well. Um, but the gist of it is, yeah, whilst the UI uh, frameworks like Swift UI and Jetpack are getting closer, I think you still have to go in and learn the underlying native code. You need to understand how like, to handle data and state and error handling on Kotlin, and you need to do the same on Swift apps. And you know those things don't necessarily come free, and it don't come for free. And you have less margin for error when you're doing it in React Native. Now, all of the code that's running in React Native is native layer code as well, but they're written by the Expo team, which I have a lot more faith in their coding abilities than I do in my own. So that that would be my counter argument to that. But no, you, they, they are getting closer. Yeah. Mo, uh, what do you think about Victor's statement from the first talk? when there was a table oh, and so and i had i had to ask when testing in react native was his and icon was head was exploding so i assume it's a headache updating was a headache and typescript doesn't work as intended uh, I mean, he, he, uh, he he prefaced it by saying that that table is subjective so well, uh, it, it's his opinion of it i didn't agree with the table i thought there were bits of it like I, uh, testing frameworks on React Native, I mean, the, the examples that were there, Appium, Detox. Most people are using Maestro that I know these days. People have migrated over. So I think like things are a bit different now. One of the things as well with testing, I think some of the core fundamental concepts that Victor was talking about, you should apply in your React Native apps. I, one of the things that I'm a bit annoying about to all of the developers at our company is I keep on talking about this one hook per screen rule. They're so annoyed of me, I swear. And like, it's this concept of saying like, None of your application state, your UI like data fetching and stuff should be inside the component itself. It should live in a custom hook that does all of that. And what that means is the testing is significantly simpler because you're testing like input output. You know, if data is like this, will it throw down an error? And then you assume that the UI components are gonna handle that. Like it, it's a known testing principle. It's called the humble object model that Martin Fowler's got like three articles about. So you can go and read it. So like, that is great stuff that we can learn, but it doesn't come for free in TypeScript. So I can understand it saying it's not coming for free, but it's not impossible in React Native. I think if you have the right people teaching you and you have the right architecture in place, it's actually very simple to get that. And you're still using a UI library with 111,000 stars.
Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm thank done. you, everyone. Uh, <laughs>